I have no doubt that I'm sexually and romantically attracted to guys, that I'm gay in that sense. That's not who I am, it's just part of how I am, it's part of my experience, it's a descriptive reality. There are lots of other things that are true of me that aren't my identity. And identity, the key thing is, what do I need to embrace to find my best life? And actually, I think I need to embrace what God says about me. And so if God says that in Christ I'm a child of God, it's living out what it means to be a child of God that I find my best life. Not say that who I am at my core is a gay man and therefore I need a gay relationship to live that out. Andrew, or, or perhaps a straight person who, who holds Andrew's perspective, is not trying to exclude. That's not their starting point. Their starting point is their understanding of scripture. Now, I think, might think they might, might be completely mad, completely wrong. Uh, I might think their understanding of scripture is completely wrong. But we've got to treat people like human beings on both sides of this conversation. And I think we've been really, really poor at doing that. I think in, in a sense, all of us in this, all of us who have had these conversations over time. Welcome to a live show from Premier Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley, and it's my absolute pleasure to be joined today by Charlie Bell and Andrew Bunt for a show discussing sexuality, gender and identity. Two views on LGBT and the church and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us live for today's show. Uh, I would love to know where you're watching from. If you're joining us live, do feel free to tell us in the chat. I can already see greetings from Suffolk. So if you've got greetings to send us, uh, do put them in the chat. It'd be great to know where you're tuning in from. Uh, you're going to be able to ask questions today. Uh, that's the joy of doing a live online show. Uh, so at about the halfway mark, um, we'll go to your questions on tonight's show. And I look forward to seeing what you're asking our guest today. Oh, I can see so many people telling us where they're coming from. Jerusalem, Smithfield, Norfolk, New York, Cornwall. Oh, goodness me. They're coming thick and fast now. Anyway, um, let me tell you what we're doing tonight uh, and introduce my guest. Andrew Bunt is Emerging Generations Director at Living Out, author of Finding Your Best Identity. In it, he tells his own story and why he believes that Christian marriage is actually male-female, and celibacy usually the calling of believers like him who find themselves attracted to the same sex. Our other guest is Charlie Bell, who's a gay Anglican priest. He's also a psychiatric doctor. His book, Queer Holiness, affirms the place of LGBT people in all aspects of ministry and uh, the case for same-sex marriage in the church as well. And of course, this is an apt time to be talking about these issues here in the UK, at least, uh, as the Church of England is debating same-sex marriage. Uh, their synod is going on at the moment where those issues are under review. And of course, society in general is dominated by these issues. Uh, transgender especially has become quite a culturally divisive issue in some parts of the world. And we'll be discussing how Christians should respond to LGBT both in culture and in the church. So uh, Charlie and Andrew, welcome along to the show. Great to have you both with me. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. Well, let me let me begin by um, asking you, Andrew, a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your own journey up to this point and the book that you've written. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So my story starts off. I grew up in a Christian home, was really blessed to kind of hear about Jesus from a very young age and made a commitment first to follow Jesus at a pretty young age. I think around five or so, like lots of kids, kind of a few point in my childhood when I gave my life to Jesus and kind of recommitted myself to following him. And so by the time I reached my uh, teenage years and began to, or by the time I reached those years, I was very clear. I loved Jesus, wanted to faithfully follow him. And as I began to experience that time of life, as most of us do at that point, romantic and sexual desires, I began to realise that those were towards other guys rather than for girls around me. At that point, at that time, I don't think I quite knew what that was, what was going on. I kept quiet about it initially, but over a few years, began to realise, okay, this seems to be not changing. This seems to be a reality for me. Began to realise what was going on a bit more, I guess. And then I had to go on a journey of, okay, I want to faithfully follow Jesus. I seem to be gay or same-sex attracted, whatever language we want to use for that. How do I kind of bring these things together? And really, I think there were then two questions that I journeyed through. And actually, in the kind of providence of God and the goodness of God, he kind of laid those out for me quite well. The first question was just the question, well, what does God say about this? What does God say about sex and relationships and marriage, about same-sex relationships? I ended up in a context where I had to address that question because a whole half of my A-level religious studies turned out to be a, a class on homosexuality and Christianity. And so I was in this class where all these different viewpoints were being put forward. The mm. teacher was a lovely guy who was going to be a Catholic priest, but was gay, didn't feel live by the church's teaching. And so he was trying to present to us all these arguments from Christians of why same-sex relationships were acceptable and how the Bible didn't outlaw them and stuff. 
And so I had to really wrestle with these. But as I did that, I just found all the arguments saying that same sex, sexual relationships were acceptable to God pretty unconvincing. And I found actually, as I sought to try and faithfully understand what the Bible seemed to be saying, it was saying what I'd been taught, that actually marriage and sex are reserved for one man, one woman, lifelong unions as Christians for kind of 2000 years, almost without exception, have believed. And so that was kind of a key moment. Okay, this is, I think, what God is saying. I've obviously continued to wrestle with that question, engage with lots of different arguments and pushbacks to different viewpoints on that. But I've just become more and more convinced that actually that is what the Bible teaches and what faithful Christian living looks like. I therefore kind of concluded, okay, I'll be single and celibate. And I was maybe 17 at that point. I was young, a little bit naive and pragmatic, maybe. I thought that'll be easy. That'll be fine. Got to my early 20s and realized, okay, let's be honest, being single being celibate is slightly harder than I realized. And the second question really wasn't, it wasn't re-questioning what does God say. I was quite clear on that. I didn't really kind of shift. It was, okay, how do I live this out? And particularly around celibacy, singleness, almost the does this work? Is this a good way to live life? And proceeding in my early 20s, that was actually really tough for me. I was really kind of wrestling with that question. But through various things, which we might talk about as we go through our time together, I guess, realised, no, I really think it is a good way and a a possible way, a plausible way of living life. Particularly the key one for me was realising, actually, my desire for sex really actually was a desire for love. And although God was saying, actually, the kind of sexual relationship I might be interested in wasn't open to me and the kind of marriage I might be interested in wasn't open to me, he wasn't saying I couldn't experience love because friendship, church's family, that's a context in which I can experience that. And that began to be my experience and began to realise, I think this is doable. Mm. It's a plausible way of living life. That was kind of 10 years ago-ish, I guess. And I wouldn't want to say it's being easy to, to live that out, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to hold together. This is what God seems to say. This is therefore how I live this out. And actually there are plausible kind of ways of living that. Yeah. And and the book that you've written, Finding Your Best Identity, it doesn't just deal with obviously the issue of um same sex mm-hmm. attraction, but but also transgender as well. Um and and this I'm sure most people are aware is increasingly a common issue in culture uh, today. Mm-hmm. I guess you've got that in mind, and especially probably young people going through the same kinds of questions you were going through, uh, but perhaps with regard to transgender as well in, in that book, Andrew. Absolutely. Yeah, the book very much flowed out my own experiences of questions around identity, a lot of which were around sexuality and different kind of identity messages that were being told to me. I was observing in the world around me. Partly it's well related to gender. There was a time in my childhood uh, when I came to the conclusion that I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. I remember that very vividly. And I kind of, that naturally went away as I went through puberty and through my teenage years, which is a not uncommon experience for people who experienced that before puberty. But I kind of knew what it was like to have that real sense of tension and incongruence in what I felt inside and what my body was saying and just kind of thought we need to think about this well and deeply I think the church often hasn't done that well often hasn't treated LGBT full stop including maybe especially trans people well and someone wanted to engage with that and so the book yeah is saying actually how do we get identity right which helps us to think about sexuality and gender and particularly how do we form identity I'm basically saying we rightly ask who am I but before who am I we've got to ask how do I find who I am And actually, how does the Bible's answer to how do I find who I am give us actually, for one thing, just the best identity anyway, but also give us an identity which is the best kind of foundation from which to respond to our our varied experiences of both sexuality and gender? Well, we'll come back to the issue of identity in the course of the discussion. Um, Let me introduce Charlie as well. Uh, Charlie, you're here as a gay Anglican priest. You've got a new book out as well. Uh, It's called Queer Holiness. Tell us about your journey and a little bit about the book. Yeah, thanks so much. So it's lovely to be with you. Um, So I never thought I'd be, uh, I never thought I'd be an Anglican priest. Um, I I grew up uh, as a, in the United Reformed Church and actually changed uh, to be an, become an Anglican almost by mistake. Um, I, I, I was a chorister as a, as a child in, in, uh, down in Chichester and uh, in, 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 in South England. And, uh, and, and really, we, I was just going to remain United Reformed, but, but um, one of the first kind of church clashes or challenges that we found in, in, in my very young life was my sister was, well, my parents wanted my sister to be baptised and, um, and they were told, well, because they weren't attending the, the church every week, um, because they were coming to see me every other week in the cathedral. Um, well, actually, you can't have your you can't have your daughter baptized. And for me, th- this and and for them, I mean, I was only seven or eight years old. But for them, it was a very big 
change really for, and 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 so we'd never really thought we'd become uh we never really thought we'd become a um, become anglicans we certainly uh we it was it was never even in the in the sort of uh suggestion of our of my youth so um so we became anglicans by mistake and here we are really mm-hmm. um you know i i i think i probably realized my my sexuality at, at, at roughly the same time as 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 many people growing up the same time as as me did you know around probably early early teenage years um for me um i i hadn't come across a theology which had um which had said that there would be any kind of uh, clash really um so i come to this from quite a different position it's quite interesting a lot of people um particularly a lot of of, of, of gay christians who have kind of who have become um uh, in a sense uh, thinking well has have come to a similar position as mine have gone through a long process whereby actually they hadn't thought that initially um i hadn't come across uh the the, the sort of theology of uh that, that andrew's been talking about really when i was much younger and i came to it more as a, as a young adult and then um mm-hmm. through into university years so um so so i i mean i think i found growing up as a uh, a gay youngster in sussex pretty tough um it was i mean culturally it was not at all um a, a, an open conversation um so so um in many ways that's where i found my challenges and i actually mm. found the church to be one of the most welcoming and and sort of uh, uh and sort of uh, at least challenging environments in which to find myself so which is which is very different i think from what a lot of people yeah feel. Um, we'll come to the current conversations of yeah. the church of england they're having in just a moment but if you don't mind me asking how does it work for someone who is a clergy who is gay uh what what does the current uh stipulations are if you like in the anglican church on, on that front yeah it's a helpful question so i mean um so obviously the church of england's one part of the wider anglican communion but in the church of england um uh, the rules are pretty clear really and it's very rules based um and and essentially uh, you can you can somewhat grudgingly have a partner um but you cannot marry them um uh, you you initially you should not enter into civil partnership with them but now you should enter into civil partnership with them which is interesting as time has, has moved on um but uh, but celibacy is is an absolute uh, and celibacy is is a, is a valid question when you're considering uh, entering into the ordained uh, process uh, to become ordained and then remain something which can be asked of you uh, during your ministry so you can be with a partner and um, but that partnership must remain celibate but you would like that to change and I, as i understand it you would like yourself to be married in the anglican church yeah that's right i mean i could in a sense i could already get married in an anglican church i could go to scotland or to wales america to the united states parts of canada new zealand and so on so there's plenty of places where i could be married in an anglican church but if i did that now um i would lose my license or certainly right. wouldn't be granted another one yeah i see i see talk to us and then we'll get andrew to chime in on this as well about what's currently going on in the anglican church there's been a lot of headlines over the last couple of weeks and um, there's been this living in love and faith dialogue process across the whole of the church it now seems to have culminated in the bishops presenting some um suggestions advice uh, that's caused a lot of controversy no one seems to be happy about it on either side now it's going to the general synod which is taking place literally as we're recording today's episode so tell us tell us you know if you can in a nutshell what's going on yeah. charlie yeah, so I mean, we've been debating this for 50 years or so, um, and there's been process after process. And I think the main reason that we are where we are today is because in 2017, the bishops went to the General Synod of the Church of England, the governing body of the Church of England, and, and presented a, a paper which, which said, you know, we recognise that we haven't got things right necessarily in terms of tone or the way that we've engaged with people, but actually uh, we don't think there should be any change in pastoral practice. So for putting that simply, things like blessings and so on. Um, and that was thrown out by the General Synod of the time. And so five years later, we've had long, long conversations um, trying to listen to each other rather than talk over each other, um, which has been in many ways a really helpful process. But one of the things that's come from that has been a, a real um, a, a keenness on behalf of actually people from varying theolo- theological perspectives. The bishop should lead uh, and to come up and the bishop should really have um a some kind of way forward that they can own themselves um of course the problem is that uh, whatever the bishops then come up with is not necessarily going to be what everybody would like and mm. that's in a sense where we found ourselves now the proposals are in front of general synod but i think bishops are going to lead uh, and perhaps um slightly change proposals based on what general synod say but i think we now have a pretty clear direction of travel for the church of england's going to go in the next couple of years 
and, and as I understand it, the, the proposals were have been that the that they're not proposing a change in the doctrine of marriage per se, but they are um, suggesting liturgies that would allow priests to bless same sex partnerships, um, even if those are not yet being allowed to kind of be made formal in marriage in the church itself, that, that blessings for same sex couples would be legitimate. Yeah, forward. that's right. And anything from um, a covenanted friendship, so something really with no, ex really clearly, explicitly a non-sexual relationship, um, through to possible to to blessing of, of civil marriages, um, as you say, not marriages in church, um, on which the bishops have not really um, made much comment on whether those would or would not be sexual, but certainly with an intention that within that kind of group of things that the church might mm. bless, um, there may well be sexual relationships between yeah. people of the same sex. Well, I know that you're not an Anglican yourself, Andrew, so so your your knowledge in this area is limited inevitably. But um, I'm sure like me, you've seen a lot of the headlines and the, the talk about about it. Uh, it seems to me like both, you know, there's lots of people who aren't happy on either side, whether they're considered themselves progressive or conservative progressives, you know, who want full inclusion, you know, gay marriage in the church. Uh, progressives who think this is going too far um blessing something that they say is you know it's a fudge you can't sort of have have your cake and eat it as it were um so andrew what's what's your you know even, even as an outsider when it comes yeah, to yeah. Church, what's, what's your thoughts on all this yeah looking on in yeah i mean i can understand why people on every side are disappointed i think what what everyone needs is clarity and I don't think that's actually what has been offered and what the bishops have so far put forward. I think everyone needs clarity in these questions. For someone like me particularly, who's gay, who wants faith people of Jesus, I need to know what does that look like? And I don't think the proposals currently have a clear view of what does faithfulness to Jesus look like for someone in my situation. And I do think that the criticism some people make in that there seems to be a real contradiction in what the bishops are saying is kind of fairly true. They're simultaneously saying we're going to pray prayers of blessing over people in relationships uh, including, it does, I think, now seem clearly they're implying sexual same-sex uh, relationships, while also they're saying we're not changing the church's doctrine, which is that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. And also the church's doctrine is that sex is reserved for marriage. There is a contradiction, and they're doing some fancy footwork around blessing and the distinction between civil marriage and holy matrimony is trying to get around that. I don't think it works. I think there's contradiction. But actually, one of my main kind of concerns and reflections, having read what the bishops put out, is just the sadness that there's no theological kind of reasoning given for this. There's no theological basis, no biblical basis offered to why they're now introducing these prayers, which previously weren't there, why we're going to get into this situation. And really, I think what we're getting is just this compromise. And the whole purpose of LFS, LFF was to discern together. And I presume the discerning was to find truth. We as Christians believing absolute truth, including moral truth, Presumably the process was defined, what is the truth? What's the right position? And they haven't given us any of that. They've just given us this total compromise. And so kind of as an outsider, it's easy for me to say as an outsider, I thought the bishop should have done is to do what Christian leaders are meant to do, which is guard the truth, make it clear what Christian theology on this is. And then the second step, help us all to live out, live that out and help us find the ways that we can all follow Jesus faithfully in that. And I agree with Charlie, everyone's looking for the bishops to lead. I don't think they are in what they've actually done and produced. Charlie? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really tricky because I think ultimately the, the compromise or the messiness of this is a reflection of where we are as a church at the moment. Um, and I think there are, I mean, General Synod is not the, you know, I don't, I quite agree with Andrew, you know, um, do doctrine in many ways should not be made by, by um, you know, popularity contest. Mm -hmm. And and also General Synod is not really a reflection of the Church of England in terms of those in its pews and so on. So it's a very, it's a very challenging place um, to for, for these kind of conversations to take place. But I think across the Living in Love and Faith project over the five years or so, it has become clearer that there are not just two, but two kind of clear strands of thinking that are running through the Church of England, um, one of which is, you know, that 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 just taking blessings, for example, that, that blessing should not be permitted, that this is not a good thing, that it would not be approved of, that it, and, it, and it should, um, you know, and that um, people who are gay should remain uh, celibate. And then you've got people who, who find, find themselves after scriptural engagement and in integrity in a totally different place. Um, and the problem then is, how do you hold those two things together? Um, and, and Andrew's quite right, nobody's necessarily happy with this, but also there's politics to it. Um, mm. And in a sense, there was no clear, strong majority for one position or the other. Uh, and that leads us to where we are, which is, which is trying to say two things at the same time. Let's talk about 
the issues at stake, because in a sense, we're going to talk about the theology uh, in the course of today's show. Coming back to your book, Andrew, um, Finding Your Best Identity, I've got a copy of it here, actually, as well as Charlie's book, Queer Holiness. Um, it's, it is about identity primarily. Um, and what's one of the things you say early on is be who you truly are can be a bit of a misleading maxim. You say God decides our identity, not us, not other people. Talk to me a bit about that and 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 let's see what Charlie has to say in response. Sure. Yeah, I mean, be who you truly are. It's a complex one. In some ways, I want to say yes, absolutely. In some ways, that's exactly what the New Testament calls Christians to. The question, of course, is who are you truly? Who is the true you you need to be true to? And that's kind of what I'm trying to explore. How do we find the true us, as it were, to whom we should be true and kind of live out that identity? Um, and it might be worth saying when I'm talking about identity, because one of my observations, having spent years now thinking about identity, is is a classic word we use loads, we don't define, we talk past each other. So what I the way I'm using it in the book particularly is this little phrase I use controlling self-understanding. So self-understanding, mm. how we view ourselves, who we believe ourselves to be at our core, what's most fundamental about us. And what you really believe about yourself deep down will automatically have effects on you. It will shape your thinking, uh, your feeling, your living. And so that's why I call it controlling. Your self-understanding, in a sense, has some controlling impact on you. And so the question becomes, OK, we've all got that. How should that be formed? And what I'm trying to say is I don't think the ways of our culture are very helpful to us, which is to let other people decide how we view ourselves or to look inside ourselves at our desires, our feelings, including perhaps our sexual desires, and to embrace that as identity. I think actually that the better way and the biblical way actually is that our sense of self gets shaped by what God says about us. And I think we see that as the kind of assumed approach throughout scripture. You see it beautifully illustrated in the life of Jesus. When Jesus is baptized and he comes about the water, this voice comes from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. It's a picture of what I call God decides identity. God the Father declares who Jesus is and Jesus kind of absorbs that and allows that to shape his sense of who he is. And I think this way of doing identity is really good news, because if our identity is based on what other people think of us or what we find inside, there's just so much pressure. If it's other people think of you, it's pressure to I've got to make people impressed by me, think well of me, otherwise I get a bad identity. If my identity is based on what I find inside of me, I'm going to be honest, there's a mess of stuff inside of me. How do I decide what's the real me inside this mess? And there's this pressure of only I can work out because only I know what's inside. It's just not good. But actually, Christian identity, God's size identity, says the pressure's off. God's telling you. And Christian identity is a stable identity because it's based on the work of Christ. And that's never going to change. And it's so wonderfully life giving because we know it, we're loved, we're accepted based on everything God has done for us. I mean, in the LGBT sort of culture we live in now, there, there is this sense that what you're saying, is, the pushback would be, I assume, look, if if a young person is feeling a certain type of identity, they're feeling like they're, you know, their their gender doesn't match their biological sex or they're feeling attracted to people of the same sex, what they feel should be affirmed, you know, and, and it's wrong to kind of say, no, that's not who you are or you shouldn't act on that or you shouldn't pursue that or, um, you know, because that is who you are deep down and repressing it can have bad effects. It could be bad for your mental health. It could be, you know, bad generally. So what's your response to that? Because the, the natural sort of message we get is precisely almost the opposite. It is be who you yeah. feel you are in in a sense. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's what culture is telling us. And as per usual, Christians have a different view from the culture as they do on so many things. The question comes, yeah, to who are we really? And what I'm not saying is we deny the, react, the fact that we have um, a sexuality or we deny the fact that for some people there's a genuine experience of feeling like internally their gender is different to what their body is saying. I'm not at all saying those experiences aren't true. I'm just saying they're not core to who we are. So I have no doubt that I'm sexually and romantically attracted to guys, that I'm gay in that sense. That's not who I am. It's just part of how I am. It's part of my experience. It's a descriptive reality. There are lots of other things that are true of me that aren't my identity. And identity, the key thing is, what do I need to embrace to find my best life? And actually, I think I need to embrace what God says about me. And so if God says that in Christ, I'm a child of God. It's living out what it means to be a child of God that I find my best life not say that who I am and my core is a gay man and therefore I need a gay relationship to live that out. And you're absolutely right that the narrative in our culture is it's going to be very dangerous, very unhealthy if we don't embrace and express these things. And I'm just not convinced the evidence is there for that. Uh, that's certainly not my experience. I'm not sure there's a logic in that. There's lots of sexual desires. We'd all recognise. We wouldn't say that's who you are. You need to embrace that and live that out. There's just lots of reasons. I think it doesn't seem to tally with logic or with uh, experience at, and even kind of some of the research I think it's about to suggest we 
need to embrace everything we feel and live it out as who we are. We need to healthily acknowledge them, not ignore them, not deny it, not hide it, feel ashamed of it, but actually we don't have to embrace it and live it out because that's not core identity. What, what do you make of that, Charlie, yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting area. I mean, for me, we don't affirm everything. I mean, I think in in even wider society doesn't affirm everything we feel. Would certainly not say it's a, it's right to act on um, on everything that we feel. And you know, that can go to very dark places if that was the place that we would suggest. And you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm a psychiatrist. There are elements um, of psychiatry which would certainly go against affirming everything that people feel. Um, so I think that's I think that's one thing to think uh, think about. But I think there is a sense of discernment as to what um, what is what, what um, if we uh, cast it aside allows us to conform more to Christ, and then those things which if we cast it aside actually might distort the image of God that God has given to us. And I think in a sense, um, without wanting to oversimplify the whole debate, in a sense I think that is actually at the heart of a lot of what we're discussing. Um, so for me, I, I'm, I don't think that many um, you know LGBT Christians um, actually find their primary identity in their LGBT ness, as what as it were. Um, I think, um, and certainly would not, not not state that that was the case. Um, I think most most LGBT Christians would find their their identity in Christ in the first place. I think they just understand uh, what that identity might look like as as being slightly different um for me the bible is 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 a kind of record or a narrative of, of relationship relationality both of god to uh, god's people and amongst god's people and so on and so for me i suppose when i'm approaching the scriptures i'm not looking that uh, i'm not i'm not saying that um every form of relationship must be affirmed for example i'm not saying that um every everything that we feel is necessarily right but i do think that we need to approach scripture with our eyes open about what the world uh is like i think we're as christians i think sometimes we sort of base a lot of what we say about the world on the world that we wish were existed um and rather than the kind of world that actually is and so for me looking at uh for example uh, the quality of relationship between people who who, who are um, in relationship with people of the same sex but also looking at the impact of um of of uh, the re repression of certain parts of our personalities. To me, I find it very hard to square that with the underlying story of relationality that God tells in the, in the Bible. So, so I don't. I, I certainly wouldn't. I, I certainly think the key focus on identity is is there. I just think probably um, how we get to that and and what we think is important in the way that we uh, read scripture, rather than whether scripture is important, is actually key to this discussion. Do, do you worry that people like Andrew who have for scriptural reasons or because of their biblical convictions if you like decided to to go the celibate route believing that that is the kind of identity god is calling them to in in the way they understand their christian faith do you worry that that could have ill effects that it could be repressing something do you think that in general you know this is a bad sort of thing to do if you if you have if you are attracted to the same sex you know by and large you should go ahead and and, and live that life I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? And I and, you know, it's very hard. I think it's really useful, actually, for us to be talking as individuals to each other, because it's very easy to start casting. Well, this is a this is how things should be or this is. And actually, that's not who human beings are. And each human being is unique um, and different. And so in a sense, there is definitely a call to celibacy. Um, I think we can see that uh, in wider society. I think we can see that people are called to celibacy and in, in, to singleness uh, in, in even even in the secular world. But there's certainly a call to celibacy biblically. Um, there's certainly a call to celibacy in the tradition of the church. My question is, um, what is informing that call? Uh, and what do we mean when we say celibacy freely chosen? So I do worry when celibacy is not freely chosen about the psychological impact that that will be having on individuals. Um, and therefore, that does make me wonder whether saying that celibacy is the way or the, the primary way for people who are attracted to people of the same sex, that that for me um, is not really borne out by the psychological evidence. And so I get a bit um, uncomfortable when that's then presented as the only way, because I'm not sure that that does allow people to live a fully kind of flourishing, uh, engaged, um, sort of loving human life in the way that, you know, we all want for everybody. Andrew? Yeah, I think it's really helpful stuff in there. And I agree that it's so healthy that we can have kind of conversations like this. I'd love to come back to the celibacy thing, but just first, I really like the fact that you're right, actually, no one in our culture, almost no one says every desire and every kind of relationship should be affirmed. And that therefore it's how we discern which relationships are and aren't to be affirmed. And I think that's where 
I'm sensing a difference. And certainly as I read and greatly enjoyed actually your book, but where I read your book, I felt a real difference to where I'm coming from. But actually, I think for Christians, the discernment starts from scripture. And actually the words you just used there, I think were about the quality of a relationship and the impact of a relationship. But actually to me, on a biblical perspective, Christian ethics isn't based on things like the quality of love or the impact of something. It's not a kind of harm and happiness um, way of doing ethics like our culture is. It's a ethic based on the fact there's a creator who's got a design and a plan for us and so for me the how do we discern what kind of relationships should and shouldn't be affirmed the primary thing is scripture and I'm not sure I, th- I, th- I think your book is indicating that experience to cause us to reread scripture it didn't show me which text we reread and kind of why and how and my worry is that actually it becomes experience causes us to dismiss scripture and so I'd have to go, yeah, come back to the celebrity thing, but maybe could I ask you, Charlie, I think your book says, I think, I kind of experience taking scientific study, psychological study seriously, which I agree I want to do in the church often hasn't done well. And you talk about that helping us to reread texts. Can you help us see how it does that for this topic? Or is it actually we're saying we think the text must be wrong, so we're dismissing it because this is such strong evidence elsewhere? No, I wouldn't say it's the latter of those two things. I mean, I don't think that experience can tell us that scripture is wrong in that sense. Um, I don't think that's what's, I don't think that's what it's about. And I, and I think it's more than experience. I think it's more also kind of scientific discovery and understanding. Yeah. So for me, um, science, discovery, uh, all of those things which are kind of associated with, with um, you know, experimentation, understanding the natural world and so on, that's all, um, in my book, a gift from God. So mm-hmm. it's it's a gift for us to better engage with the world more widely. I think we all bring our baggage to scripture in a sense. We try not to. And we all, uh, it's, it's very interesting when we sort of say, well, um, you know, I don't, in, I don't interpret scripture. I just read it. I mean, no one, no one reads scripture without some level of interpretative lens, however much we try and take it off. I suppose for me, when God is speaking through scripture about human beings, I want to approach scripture uh, in a sense, uh, talking, therefore reading scripture as scripture about the human beings that we know are rather than mm-hmm. about um, a kind of slightly, um, in, in a sense, a sort of slightly, um, uh, you know, a fantasy version of a human being. And so when I, so I suppose in a sense, what I'm saying is when we know this about human beings, we know that there is a, you know, a, a pretty fixed um, a sexual preference, for example, um, in human beings. We know that um, that doesn't change over time. Um, we know that, and well, certainly it can't be intentionally changed, all these kind of things. When we know that, and then we approach scripture, um, for me, it's, so what does scripture say about relationships? Um, and so and so I'm not trying to address individual texts and say well let's take experience to this so clearly that text must be wrong that verse must be wrong and mm-hmm. so on but rather saying knowing what we know about human beings how now do we apply the strictures and the and the 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 impressions and the um and the commandments and so on of scripture to human beings as they are um and i think there's i think there's valid grounds for disagreement um when when you approach scripture in that sense um but i do think that's kind of for me i don't think we do scripture a service by not uh, approaching it with what we know um from the kind of secular sciences as well yeah I'm all for having those things in dialogue with scripture. I'm just, uh, I would love to hear some examples of when it comes to, because we have to, we have to eventually boil down to what actual scriptures say. Scripture isn't just leaving us an overall impression from which we live our lives. We listen to the words of scripture. It's, it's striking when Jesus is asked about a related topic of marriage and divorce. He says, have you not read? And he quotes two little bits of verses. You could accuse him of proof texting almost in a sense, quotes little verses. And so can you help us see how do we deal with what the Bible says, especially about the, the definition of marriage, I might put it, especially Jesus saying Matthew 19, Mark 10, how does experience change the fact that, as I read it, Jesus explicitly defines marriage as male and female there? How does experience, you know, how is that not just saying that's wrong and we're changing what Jesus says? I, I'm wanting to understand what you're saying, but not seeing how it works when we get and, to the text. And if I could jump in with a text uh, again, because um, we might as well start talking about, you know, the specific text and, and how you understand them charlie um one person is asked in a question how from the plain reading of scripture for example romans 1 24 27 would someone conclude that god does not forbid same-sex relationship and marriage and for those who aren't familiar with the, the scripture um it's it's you know a, a frequent verse that's in, invoked in this kind of a debate um from romans 1 therefore god gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity to the degrading of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. 
their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own person the due penalty for their error. I mean, that's just obviously a, a segment of a much yeah. longer theological argument. But that perhaps what Andrew's already mentioned about Jesus' own seeming to affirm the male and femaleness mm-hmm. of marriage and, and obviously many other texts that we could have gone to in, in the New and Old Testament, Charlie. Where, where do you go with the specifics then of those particular texts? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I have to admit, I'm not convinced by the, the St. Matthew argument um, that, that, I mean, in, in St. Matthew's gospel, Jesus is being asked as a test, as it says in the previous, uh, to test him, it says in the previous verse, um, you know, um, she, you know, about essentially a question about divorce. And there's, and and, and I think that text, um, I think to move from, this is a text about, um, about, well, essentially about divorce, to move from that to Jesus then referring to, do you not know that, um, you know, that have you not read the Genesis text? male and female he created them and so on and that, uh, for me I'm, I think that's quite a logical jump to then say so therefore Jesus says that marriage is between a man and a woman I think what Jesus says is marriage is indissoluble um, and in a sense that for me is the reader that that's what I would read from those texts um, just to return your Romans uh, 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 point for me a lot of what is being said in in Romans and elsewhere in Pauline and pseudo Pauline writing is um, that, that look these are the fruits of those who disobey God these are the fruits of those who um, who go against the will of God who who um, who who refuse to obey the commandments who are living evil lives living against it and for me in a sense um, I, that's not what we're talking about in the society where we see people of the same sex wanting to uh wanting to marry we're seeing uh, you know fully faithful decent christians come to church and want to marry one another they're not um they're not you know going on great orgies or you know that none of this is and, and it's not some great attempt to uh to and we can't from from what we see of people behaving like that we're not saying that that's the fruit of evil uh, at least i don't think we are because we're starting from a different place. We're starting from the place where we say people want to form monogamous same-sex relationships and have them blessed by God. We're not saying they've turned away from God and therefore all these things happen. So I think we just need to be careful how we read into those texts as to what the the, the, the sort of um, the initial purpose of those texts was and also what, what St Paul, what the Lord, whoever is saying within these texts about particular individuals. For me, I just, I, I'm not convinced that we can necessarily easily pluck out from texts about something else a, a reference to same-sex relationships as they are in the 21st century for example andrew what's your response to that yeah i mean in one sense romans one is never want to start there's these few references prohibiting i think same-sex sexual activity but that's because the bible has this beautiful plan for marriage and sex without christ in the church you know these things only make sense because the bigger beautiful story but since we've gone there i mean I, I, I don't know if I fully understood, understood Charlie's reading there. I think I actually feel very similar to you, but I think Paul is talking on a cosmic scale, not an individual scale. So he's not saying these are the outworkings of individual sinful people and we can look at our world and see it's not the outworkings of gay relationships today. He's saying that we as humanity turned against God. And he's deliberately echoing Genesis 1 in some of the languages he uses, the words he uses for male and female. He talks about creation. He's very clearly going back to creation. And because humans ignored the creator and instead worshipped the creator, God gives all of us, every single one of us, over to sinful desires. And before he mentions same-sex sexual activity led by sinful desires, he mentions all sexual activity led by sinful desires. And afterwards, he'll mention all sorts of things. So I think same-sex sexual activity here is deemed as one of the, and only one of the examples of sinful activity, and it's sinful because it goes against God's creational intent. And Paul very deliberately is bringing to our minds creation, ah, because sin by definition is is going against creation. I'd love to talk about Matthew, because I'd much rather talk about Jesus in yes, sense please, than go ahead. Romans 1. Charlie, I totally agree. No, the question is a, yeah, a test for Jesus about divorce. And of course, what's fascinating is they're asking about the Old Testament law on divorce. And what Jesus does is he doesn't start having an argument about the minutiae of Old Testament law. He goes back to the design. He goes back to Genesis 1 because what marriage is. So his answer on divorce is by defining marriage. And what I find so fascinating is how Jesus uses Genesis. So he quotes Genesis 2.24, the famous verse, a man leaving his father and mother, holding fast, becoming one flesh with his wife, and makes the point, because you become one flesh, divorce shouldn't be happening. 
he, he only needed to quote Genesis 2.24 to make his point. And yet he also quotes those few words from Genesis 1.27, male and female, he made them. And it struck me recently, Jesus didn't need to say that. That's completely redundant to his point about divorce. And yet he feels the need to explain and to make explicit marriages are unions of a man and a woman. And he literally juxtaposes them. Male and female, he made them. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and his father. Why does marriage exist, Jesus says? Partly because God made male and female. So I just can't get away from the fact that Jesus, even though he didn't need to, quoted male and female, he made them, links it to marriage. And I can't see how Jesus doesn't affirm marriage to therefore be between a man and a woman. I mean, I, I just wonder whether it's kind of another way of looking at it would be that, that Jesus is just is just taking Genesis to court. It's taking the whole thing together and saying that this is and, and actually referring back to the Genesis narrative as as this is this is what human beings are all about. Um, of exactly. course, men what and people, marriage is but, all about. But, but then, of course, the question comes comes back to what do we mean by men and female? He created them. Um, and, you know, there are a variety of opinions on this, both within within Jewish um, uh, readings of the scripture and also within Christian readings of the scripture about um, male and female. Uh, he created one individual so that the two sides are the same individual. Or is it male and female? He created them or is it he created them both male and female plus plus plus. I, that, I, and I'm not saying that to be you know difficult, but I do think that it's to, to go from a very uh, from what is already a contested part of the Hebrew to then a determined and therefore Jesus said that marriage is between a man and a woman, I think is just a logical step too far for me um, in terms of what Jesus is trying to do. But then, of course, who are we to know the mind of God? Uh, and so, again, in a sense, that's part of the, the, the problem here, which is that w we, we are both you and I and you know millions of people essentially um on on various different uh, you know theological interpretations trying to get answers to this stuff from scripture and for me it's less clear than it is for you um in terms of the way that we then our, our conclusion um and so for me that 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 is that's a challenge and i don't know how we necessarily work a way out between ourselves in terms of the millions of us um as to it it convinces you but it doesn't convince me and I don't think that either of us is 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 playing stupid in this, mm. um, and that's and that's the challenge, I think. Yeah. And the other, just oh, so I was just going to just pass pick up on the sinful desires thing as well. I mean, I do struggle with the idea that um, that that someone who is is um, born uh, or is 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 innately is innately gay um, that their desires themselves are necessarily sinful. Um, mm. so that that for yeah. me is challenging because yeah, Joe, go, 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 go back, Andrew. yeah, Andrew, sure. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad you but by yeah, by by sinful desires in that sense, I mean desires seeking to draw us away from God's plan Fine. and best. Yeah. I don't believe we're morally culpable for our desires. Yeah. All of us, you know, we can every person can relate to that. We have sexual desires and also desires that draw us away from God's plan, whether we're straight yeah. or gay. I don't think we're morally culpable. Yeah, I think that's a really unhelpful point some are trying to push, which just is really unbiblical. I mean, just before we go to some questions, I mean, this is interesting for me because because I, I think a lot of people still, e even in the Christian church, don't always distinguish between the desire and acting on the desire. So, Andrew, you're even prepared to use the moniker. I'm I'm a gay Christian. Um, when I used that sort of terminology in an Instagram post recently, a lot of people leapt on it to say, oh, you're featuring two gay Christians, Justin. Aren't we going to have a difference of opinion here? Well, obviously we do, because you, the way you then live out your sexuality, Andrew, is, is different to Charlie's take. So is, I mean, to what extent is the language troublesome here? Because a lot of people are reading a lot into just the fact that you're happy to to describe yourself as a gay Christian, Andrew. Others would say, no, you, that that has all kinds of connotations and and, and everything else. What What's your perspective on that, Andrew? Yeah, my respect of the language is complicated. Every word, you know, and particularly in a controversial topic like this, carries meanings and extra connotations and means different things to different people. And so in a sense, though, when I use the word gay, I just mean what the core meaning is to most people, I think, in our culture is that my romantic and sexual desires of people of the same sex. Yes, lots of people in our culture would also by gay mean that their sexuality has a kind of greater significance to them, a greater um, impact on their sense of being than mine does. It may also mean they want to enter into gay relationships and stuff, but it, at its core, it's not what the word means. And then you know, the alternative kind of term is same-sex attraction, the same-sex attraction, that also carries baggage because some people associate that with kind of ex-gay movements, which I absolutely don't support and don't agree with and don't want to um, be a part of. Some people think it's a very kind of, almost kind of um, 
clinical, uh, pathologizing almost kind of term. And so both gay and same-sex attracted, I think for someone from my convictions, kind of has unhelpful baggage on both sides. And actually, my honest truth, my honest, my honest opinion is, I think the debate about language, especially elsewhere in the world, but also sometimes here in the UK, has just become a really unhelpful distraction. And actually, the important questions of how do people like Charlie and I faithfully follow Jesus? And how do we actually manage to find a good way of living with Jesus becomes impossible to ask that conversation, have that conversation, because people are just policing the language we can use, which to me just doesn't, I can't believe that's what Jesus would do. Jesus cared about people, not, I think, about policing something like language. So it's kind of a debate that's had got some good points on both sides. I just think it's a distraction from the priority of loving people and thinking, let's faithfully follow Jesus. Charlie, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I just agree. I mean, I think we should call people what they want to call themselves. <laughs> Everyone comes to this. G gay is loaded with certain um, certain connotations for one person, which it's not loaded with for another person. I think we just need to be much more sensitive with one another uh, and just recognise, not always look for the worst and think, well, it must have these connotations because that means it's a bad word. I, I, you know, I don't like the word same-sex attracted because to me it, it sounds like a kind of clinical condition. Um, but, you know, for other people, it's their most comfortable way of describing themselves. And I don't see why we shouldn't just allow them to do so right well look let's go to some questions um and uh, we're going to try and get through as many as we, as we can there'll be a little bit of discussion i'm sure with each one between uh, charlie and andrew as we go just to say before we leap into them that if uh, you enjoy unbelievable if you like the mission of what we're doing trying to bring thinking faith to many people both christians and skeptics and having these kinds of dialogues uh, would you consider supporting the show it does make a huge difference we are a listener and viewer supported show uh, in fact we've got a a special gift for you if you're willing to support the show uh, from today's webinar um we've got the ebook why you can believe this is one i wrote and it spells out the case for christianity and answers to some common objections so if if that's um uh something that's of interest to you will send that to you as a thank you for your gift um the link to give is in the chat so uh you can click on that and give uh we'll be sending an email out if you're uh, registered for this se seminar as well so that you've got the link there and it's available as well um, if you're watching later on via video or listening via podcast. Um, so, yeah, do do support us if you can. It, it really helps us to continue hosting these kinds of conversations that matter. Um, let's go to some of the, uh, the the questions that are coming in here, Charlie and Andrew. Um, someone anonymous asks, how can a loving God exclude LGBTQ plus people? Do you believe, Andrew, that people living in a homosexual relationship, but who are faithfully Christian and believe in Jesus won't be part of God's kingdom? Um, so do you want to start us off with that one, Andrew? Yeah, sure. I mean, I kind of want to ask the question of what do you mean by exclude LGBT people? Here I am as a gay guy, loves Jesus. I don't think God's excluded me. The gospel is the same for every single one of us. You know, what Jesus and the Bible says to a gay girl like me or to a trans person is no different to what he says to any, every one of us. Every one of us experiences desires that seek to draw us away from his plan. Every one of us has fallen short of his plan. And yet every one of us can freely receive forgiveness and salvation and justification in Jesus and then can be empowered to live God's way as we journey towards the new creation. So I just want to challenge the notion that God excludes anyone in any sense. On the question of whether someone who is, I think the question was, who is uh, identifying as a follower of Jesus is in an act of gay relationship, what that means for eternal destiny, I'm just not qualified to say, and no, no human is. I, I, what I don't want to do is not take seriously the warnings Scripture gives us. Scripture gives us, I think, clear warnings that a choice to actively continue in what the Bible deems to be sin is not a good idea. It has serious consequences, potentially eternal consequences, but I don't think any human has the ability or right to make a pronouncement in any one situation or person so my my response there is let's take the scriptures warning seriously but it's not for any of us to actually make a judgment call there charlie do you think that andrew's approach and if you like the more conservative approach generally in the church is essentially excluding lgbt people I mean, I think you have to ask individual LGBT people about whether they feel excluded by it in a sense. I don't think anything is necessarily objective in this sense. It's, it's much more subjective as to what that particular individual feels. I mean, I do think that I do think just as Andrew was saying there, you know, taking the, the biblical um, or the, the injunctions, the biblical injunctions seriously. I think I think those of us who are in favour of uh, same sex marriage or those of us in favour of same sex sexual relationships and however we want them to see, I think have uh, at times been guilty of not recognising why this matters quite so much um, to people who take the opposing view. Um, and actually, this is not 
uh, you know, there's lots of words uh, and, and lots of hot words are said sometimes about this kind of stuff, you know, that that um, it's all about um, exclusion, it's all about hatred and all of that. And that certainly, in my experience, has occasionally reared its head in there. And, and, and just because it's a theology doesn't mean it's not homophobic. So there are elements of homophobic theology that exist, transphobic theology and so on. But I do think we need to sometimes take the heat out of these conversations a bit and recognize that actually this that uh, you know andrew or, or, or perhaps a straight person who who holds andrew's perspective is not trying to exclude that's not their starting point their starting point is their understanding of scripture now i think might think they might, might be completely mad completely wrong uh, i might think their understanding of scripture is completely wrong but we've got to treat people like human beings on both sides of this conversation. And I think we've been really, really poor at doing that. I think in, in a sense, all of us in this, all of us who have had these conversations over time. Just on the, the sort of personal pastoral front, because a lot of these actually are both a mixture of theological and personal pastoral questions. Um, another person who wants to remain anonymous says, my partner and I came to faith about four years ago. We have been living in a committed, covenantal, monogamous and faithful same sex relationship for over 21 years. We have a son who's nine and we all go to church regularly and have discussions with him about stories in the Bible and God. My question is what our salvation looks like for us if we want to live as we do and continue to model the virtues of the marriage, fidelity, sacrifice, commitment, selflessness, love, trust to our son. We don't seek to be married or have even a blessing at church purely out of respect to people who strongly feel it is against Holy Scripture. Would my partner and I rob ourselves of salvation and end up on the burnt pile of fruitless branches, is to quote John 15, 2? Or should we remain in the situation we were in when God calls us, to quote 1 Corinthians 7, 20? So this is a very specific question. I, I wonder, um, again, maybe we'll start with Charlie and then Andrew for this one. Um, Charlie, how, how would you address this this person's sort of concerns here? Yeah, and I don't think this is an unusual concern. I think, and I think this is partly what the, the bishops at the Church of England are trying to respond to in terms of giving some kind of pastoral um, practice in terms of the blessing of relationships or in terms of holding people together. I mean, I, I, one thing for me that I keep returning to uh, is the idea of the fruits. What are the fruits of these same sex relationships that we see? And I don't see the examples of bad fruits, which certain um, interpretations of, of, of Paul amongst other places would might lead me to uh, expect. And so for me, if I, if I meet somebody who is uh, in, a, in a committed covenantal monogamous and faithful same-sex relationships that's been described for over 21 years, almost invariably, I see wonderful things occurring for the community in which those people exist, usually within the church community in which those people exist. Wonderful things often for children who have been brought up either by that, that couple or, or that they have engagement with those, those children in their, in their lives, perhaps family members and so on. For me, I find it therefore very difficult to say, therefore, there's nothing good in that relationship. And that's an extreme position, perhaps. But one of the, the things which I often struggle with is, if we're saying that same-sex sexual desires, or rather acting on same-sex sexual desires, is sinful, um, I then, what, what do you say then to people for whom that same-sex relationship, which has included sex, um, has been so life-giving? And I, I struggle to find a way to say to those, or to, to find, to work out how we might, how someone might say to those people, um, the best thing for you is to break up. Because in a mm -hmm. sense, that's what the outcome, the natural outcome of that position would be. And I really struggle with being able to, to know what to do in that situation. Is, is that what your advice would be, Andrew? How would you tackle this one? <clears throat> There's lots of different things I want to say here. One is I want to affirm my agree with Charlie. There's lots of good fruit we see from gay relationships. I don't at all question that. And lots of good qualities. And yeah, the kind of qualities mentioned here of fidelity, sacrifice, commitment are often beautifully illustrated in gay relationships. And I don't deny that or want to brush that away at all. I think there's two things I want to consider. One is, I don't think fruits justify everything. I think, you know, often Matthew 7, Jesus went knowing that you'll know them by their fruits is used in this conversation. But surely in the context of the end of the Sermon Mount, the fruit is the obedience to what Jesus has said, not some kind of psychological happiness we might be feeling or some different characteristics found there. So I think the fruit that marks as a follower of Jesus is our obedience to his command. And so they want to ask, okay, what's the obedience to Jesus' command in this context? Well, if marriage is reserved and sex are reserved for life and unions of one man and one woman, then a sexual element of a relationship and also actually I think an exclusive element. So a relationship being exclusive, I think that's the other 
biblical thing that is marriage, I think that is problematic. That doesn't mean that everything about this relationship is problematic. So I do think that for anyone in this situation, and I'm aware this is a, a real life situation we're talking about, so I want to be careful and sensitive in how I say it. I think that for all of us, when we're following Jesus, there are things we have to repent of, is the biblical language, we turn away from. But I'm not saying the whole of this relationship. I would think the sexual relationship, the, the element, a an exclusive element of that, are the things which are reserved for opposite sex marriages. And then different people find different ways of it out. Some people feel actually to be faithful to Jesus, actually it doesn't work for them to stay in much relationship. Or does it, it doesn't work to stay living together. Some people I know have stayed living together, but it's no longer a sexual relationship or exclusive relationship. It's a good friendship, which exhibits so many of those characteristics. And also then the next priority, of course, when there's children involved, becomes making sure that those two people can find the best way to continue to parent that child to look out for their well-being as well so it's just i think not black and white but there are certain lines for obedience i think are what jesus calls us to you want to come back on that charlie yeah just very briefly i mean i think that the, the fruits argument i can i can see around you is coming from i think for me there's there is though um, the, the obedience to Christ or the fruits of the spirit. It's not about psychological happiness necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it's about the building up of the saints of God, you know, thinking about Ephesians. Um, and I've, and, and, and for me, actually these relationships often incontrovertibly are building up the saints of God. And that, and, and setting within churches, within the church that I'm a, a curate at, I'm a, one of the priests in the church. And, um, you know, we we have same sex relationships, which have been same sex relationships, exclusive relationships for years and years and years before, in fact, in one of the, the relationships um, before it was legal under secular law, which has undoubtedly led to the building up of the community of the church uh, and uh, in, in a variety of different ways that we might look at that. And for me, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about obedience to the Lord is the building up of the saints of God. And for me, I find it difficult to separate those things. Um, and I suppose in a sense, that's one of the reasons that I really dug into some of the, um, the, 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 or did some of my writing on this was because those, that, that was a real cognitive dissonance for me, a real tension between what I'm seeing as good in the building up of, of God's holy people and what we're saying is nonetheless not good. And I found it very hard to, to reconcile those two positions. Mm. just very briefly I, I would say two things one is i think because what i'm saying is there's only elements of that relationship i don't think match god's plan i don't think therefore the relationship can't continue to have some of the goods i think there's that kind of thing i was saying and i'm i'm having to wrestle with i can think of other examples where i feel fairly confident from scriptural teaching it's not god's will of how we could live where good fruit should still come so living out jesus command and divorce say so there's lots of people i think based on what jesus says who are divorced and jesus teaching would imply they can't marry again um you know, legitimately before god kind of thing and yet i can totally believe they could actually be in a marriage relationship that had lots of good fruits so i just can't square the idea that fruits always prove to us that something is right before god um and so yeah i'm thinking because there are other parallels i'm thinking of I'm, I'm not sure that is to me a convincing argument of what marks out right and wrong for christian faithfulness we'll go to another question if that's all right folks um jen says charlie you said near the beginning we don't affirm everything but then where is the line how do you choose what conforms us to christ rather than distorts us to use your own language with regards to sexuality and also wants to know what's so obvious to you in scripture to affirm an lgbtq plus lifestyle and, and others have asked a similar question about yeah. what would there be sort of scriptures that positively affirm if you like your position charlie but maybe uh, uh, that first that question jen's asking about you know where do you draw on the line in in that sense? How do you tell what what is affirming or distorting of our relationship with Christ? Yeah, I mean, I think basically, um, does the relationship reflect something of the relationality of God uh, and God for God's people? And and actually, Andrews uh, has has I think written about this and, and certainly spoken about this. Um, the idea of um, uh, you know, the love within marriage being uh, like Christ for for Christ's church and so on. Um, and actually, and and I and, and I think we'll probably have different views as to whether that's in 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 a sense necessarily gendered or not within within the context of marriage. But for me, that's those are the kind of relationships which I think Scripture affirms ones which. Um, which ultimately reflects something of God and ultimately reflects something of the covenant of God with God's people and so on. So for me, there are very clear examples of relationships in which that is not reflected. Um, an easy example would be an adulterous relationship. Um, that in, in that sense, that clearly falls short 
of any way of reflecting um, the the uh, goods of the relationship between uh, God and God's people. Um, so for me, that's that's the kind of the, the point for me. And in a sense, that kind of answers it, or it certainly goes towards answering the second part of, of, of that question, which is um, I'm not that interested in a sense um, in some of what have often been described as the clobber texts, unhelpfully probably, but the texts which are thought to refer directly to um, essentially sex between people of the same sex. Um, however, and I notice in the comments, some people have had their own views about what they, those verses mean, and those views can go on ad infinitum in a sense, whether it's about abusive relationships or whether it's about, uh, and, and, and so on and so on. We, won't, we haven't got time to go into that now. But in a sense, for me, actually, it's about the whole narrative of what scripture is saying about relationship and the quality of relationship and the reflection of relate god's relationship that's where my starting point would be andrew any thoughts on that well i totally agree with the yeah the like Trey said i agree with the approach for each different conclusion so I, i'm i'm not happy to uh push away as it were the clobber texts as they're sometimes called as too unclear i don't know it's interesting when jesus reaches people to speak to her at scripture his assumption is never that scripture is unclear but always the problem is on our end and that's quite challenging his assumption is scripture is clear so i want to find how does both the biblical overarching narrative fit together with those texts and so i do think that yeah marriage and sex are ultimately about christ and the church jesus calls himself the bridegroom that's why Paul talks about this explicitly in Ephesians 5. And I think Paul in Ephesians 5 is one of the primary reasons I'd say that the unity and difference that's meant to be reflective of Christ in the church is the unity of male and female. Because the whole point is there, he says, husbands and wives reflect Christ and the church respectively and have different roles. They're not the same roles. And so you get the question of in a same sex relationship, who's going to take on the Christ role? Who's going to take on the church role? The whole point Paul is saying actually is that the difference in marriage is reflecting that. And then because I think the difference in marriage is reflective of the difference or the so the male female difference in marriage is reflected of the difference in Christ and the church in um our eternal marriage with him that I think is why the so-called clobber texts are there and the reason that those texts uh I think do prohibit all sex, same sex sexual relationships is just an outworking of actually the bigger beautiful picture of sex and marriage always about the union and difference which is reflected in male and female and I actually do have sympathy for the argument that there are other ways that difference could be reflected in marriage. But I think it's very clear to me in scripture, especially Ephesians 5, I would also put Jesus' teaching in here as well, that the way God has called us to live out that difference is in male and female. And actually, I think Genesis 1 and 2 would point to that as well. A part of the purpose of male and female is these marriages. We'll maybe come back to this. Um, so many questions here, and apologies, we're going to only get to a few of them in the course of the rest of the show. But um, Peter has one for you, Andrew. Um, says, are you familiar with Ed Shaw's kitchen floor moments where he says he finds himself sitting on his kitchen floor, sobbing his heart out because he will never experience the joys of family life? For those who aren't aware, Ed Shaw is someone in, in a similar position to you, Andrew, same sex attracted Christian who has chosen a sort of celibate lifestyle. He's part of living out as, as you are. Um uh, now, this person wants to know, do you recognise that, those kitchen floor moments? And can you say how you feel that this is, quote unquote, abundant life, flourishing and the good fruit of traditional church teaching? So given, obviously, the cost and the pain that, you know, going down the celibate route can cause for, for some same sex attracted Christians, gay Christians, you know, this person is asking, you know, is it justified? Is this the abundant life that we're supposed to have if it's causing this kind of pain? That's a great question. I, I am familiar with Ed Floor's Ed, Ed Shaw's uh, kitchen floor moments. I've actually seen Ed Shaw's kitchen floor. He's a friend. Uh, <laughs> so as it happens, I'm not sat on it. I've not had a kitchen floor moment there, but I have seen the kitchen floor. I believe it happens. Um, yeah. Can I relate to some extent? Um, as it happens, I had this conversation with someone yesterday. There are certainly elements of following Jesus uh, as someone who's gay, same distracted, which my sexuality has been an area of pain. To be honest, in my life, the struggles haven't largely been about my sexuality and there have been other things I found much more painful and much more difficult. But I think what I want to say about this is all of us as followers of Jesus have times when following Jesus is really difficult and really painful and really costly. And I think that's normal Christian life because Jesus said, "Take deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That sounds quite uncomfortable. Jesus said, as you lose your life, you will find your life. 
that sounds quite uncomfortable. And actually, you know, Ed's kitchen floor moments, it's basically a Gethsemane moment. Actually, if we say actually that abundant life never means having moments of real difficulty, real pain, maybe real moments when actually our desire is to do one thing and God's instructions to do another, then we're saying that Jesus didn't experience abundant life because look at Gethsemane. And I'm not saying that we are Jesus and we repeat his life, but actually that is a, a model for us, I think, of sometimes being obedient to the Father's will is really, really painful. And I think just on the abundant life thing, which, of course, is Jesus' language, kind of John 10 and stuff, what is abundant life? What is fullness of life in that Jesus is talking about there? I think when we look at the sweep of scripture, talking about that kind of theme, I, I think it is about the relationship with him. He comes to give us abundant life. Jesus didn't come to inaugurate gay relationships, I'm afraid. He came to inaugurate relationship with him. What's the fullness of life? It's him. And actually, I think in various places in scripture, you can see the fact that actually following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean your life will be comfortable and easy. Think of people like Habakkuk. Think of people like Asaph in Psalm 73. Definitely, they're basically saying the people are not following God. Their lives are better than mine. But actually, what they also see is they've got relationship with God. That's fullness of life. That in eternity is what makes everything so wonderful because God and humans are together. So yes, sometimes it's difficult, but that's normal Christian life. And abundant life is found in relationship with God, not in feeling happy or life being easy. Give you a chance to respond as well, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I so I, I suppose I agree probably more with the premise of the question than with the answer in a sense, um, in that, you know, for me, abundance of life is about relationship with the law but I also think it, it also has um, back to my fruits thing sorry about that but back to it, there, there must be surely fruits not necessarily of, of wealth or of of, of you know um, progress in society or whatever else some of those things which we would normally use as as, as secular recognitions of of, of 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 things going well and I think Christian tradition in many ways is thank goodness beginning to recognize that some of the ways we've talked about success is really unhelpful um but 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 i think back to the fruits element for me i want to be able to turn to a young uh gay uh congregant or a young gay person seeking faith or considering faith and say to them what we will help you achieve or what we will help you achieve is a terrible word because it's not in our own in our own uh, in our own strength but what will come to you through your faith in the lord is life in all its fullness back to john 10 10 um and at the and, and i struggle to see how given all the evidence of of the sheer damage that's done to um young gay lgbt kids through um certain religious upbringings and repression and the rest of it i struggle to see how we can square that circle by saying actually we offer you some wonderful news and some wonderful abundance and wonderful fullness of life but actually compared to the rest of you know compared to not joining the church or rather compared to not um, uh, joining or rather engaging with our particular theological outlook um, I can't promise it actually is going to be any better but I mean I take and I mean Andrew's points are, are valid here you know about um, about what how do we measure what abundance of life or fruits of the spirit and so on look like and again without wanting to reduce everything to actually there are more important arguments than you know gay sex this is this is this is so much more important about what the fruits of a good life look like. And if perhaps we'd spent more time engaging in things like conversations about that before we then start trying to identify what good fruits look like, we might be in a healthier place. Um, so on the point about young people, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that is important because in in a sense, I think a lot of people they look at this and they they you know from the outside it looks like you're being asked to do something impossible basically andrew uh the, the what what is being asked by if you like um the celibate route um now so what do you say i mean how, do you is it just yeah it's going to be costly uh this is the, the cost of you know following jesus um is that the only answer you can give to a to a young person in that no no i mean on that particular thing you know it sounds impossible i think you're right i think to lots of people it, it sounds impossible and i think that's utterly unsurprising in a culture that is obsessed with sex i think that sex is the only form of meaningful love and relationship and you know we're literally being preached at all the time by world telling us sex life is about sex and sexual fulfillment is the fulfilled life and so one of the things that actually needs to help young people think is is that true is actually is that cultural narrative true and so actually is it a possible way of living life well for one thing no because jesus does it so he's a good example of how to live as fully human presumably experience abundant life and a man who never gets married and never has sex so i've got a pretty good role model to kind of to kind of go off 
And then I always want to, you know, so I have these conversations with young people and kind of actually, so they're saying, well, how can you do that? How can that be possible? Isn't that a terrible thing? So I'm asking them, well, what do you think is going to be so terrible about my life? You've got to be so lonely and isolated. But as you know, because I'm part of church family, I get to be part of more families, actually, many of my married friends, because I've got more freedom to be involved in different people's family lives. Well, actually, isn't it like you're never going to feel love because you're not having sex? You don't have sex to feel love. Sex isn't a need. Sex isn't necessary for human flourishing. And we recognise that because we all know people and say throughout history, it hasn't been necessary for human flourishing. So sometimes it's just helping young people think through our assumptions why it's going to be so bad when it actually needn't be. And definitely what I agree with is there's lots of stuff there for the church need to do. If the church aren't being real family, if we aren't getting friendship right, stuff like that, then life for me is going to feel pretty much impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about me, it's about all of us kind of playing our part. And the final thing I just want to say, because I think Charlie's right, we, we always need to have the conversation around actually where sometimes the way Christian teaching has been presented and applied to young people, I think is harmful. And I think sometimes it does fall kind of into the kind of unhealthy repression kind of thing, which is kind of basically when you're told, ignore this, don't talk about this. It's not safe to acknowledge this. You mustn't even feel this. You mustn't ever tell anyone this. All of that is so unhealthy. And I've been so blessed that I've basically, from my time of teenage years, I've had people who've helped me to see, I think God does reserve marriage for men and women, but I can be honest about my experience. I can share the pains and the sorrows of it, the wrestles of it. I don't have to deny the fact this is true. Nothing is repressed or kind of hidden away or uh, like a pressure cooker going to explode of me. Because actually I can be honest because the gospel allows us to be honest. And I want young people to hear that good news message as well. Let's go to another question here. Um, someone asks, Charlie, how do you remain in a denomination or practice that doesn't yet allow um, you to marry whom you want? Why not leave and practice your faith and call to be a priest or pastor in another denomination or practice? Why? What's keeping you in a church that currently doesn't let you do what you'd like to do in terms of marrying, Charlie? <laughs> it's a long answer, which I won't bore you with, related to the, the the nature of what I think the Church of England is in its role in the in the Universal Catholic Church of the West. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, I stay in the Church of England. I stay in the church. Some people ask this from two directions. One is, why do you stay in the church at all? And the first thing is because I think that the, the, the you know the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and 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 um, and and uh, ever, ever abundant life of Jesus Christ is true. So that's why I stay in the church, because I think it's true. And I actually think that's that for me, there's so much that actually we agree on in terms of the, the extraordinary reality of Christ dying on the cross for our sins and being raised on the third day. That for me is that's why I'm a Christian. I mean, in terms of the Anglican, in terms of the Church of England, I mean, in a sense, um, I, I do think things are changing. I mean, I, I prayed for things to change and I think things are changing and so for me um I do think that, that that there is a move on this um so I don't think it's it's quite the same as being in a church with a kind of um uh, you know hopeless future or at least a lack of optimism for, for forever being able to integrate those parts of the self but I've always tried to be pretty honest about who I am and what I do and the rest of it and I've not I've not sort of hoodwinked people into ordaining me um, and so in a sense, the Church of England has, has and, and my bishop and, ever, and, and, and people who have been involved in formation have known what they're dealing with. Um, and I've tried to try to be honest about that and recognise also that, you know, it, 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 someone, a lot of people have talked about the Anglican communion. I appreciate that, that my perspective is not is not necessarily the perspective, certainly through um, through the Church of England's uh, historical teaching and certainly not in the wider Anglican communion, too. So I think we have to be a bit um uh, would I love to get married in church? Absolutely, I would. And I think that's what God's calling me to do. But I also have to have a humility to recognise that that's not the only view in town. Hmm. Um, I, perhaps we'll go straight on to another question here. My question is uh, anonymous, um, this person says, because as a minister with a traditional evangelical biblical view on marriage, I fear the leadership within my denomination who are affirming of LGBTQ matters um, in fact, I this person believes that LGBTQ Christians are becoming vitriolic and hateful towards those who hold the traditional p uh, position. Um, how will the LGBT movement address this? Um, firstly, Andrew, is that your experience that, that that it's become so divisive that that it's becoming very hostile? I mean, this person obviously feels that there is hostility towards the more conservative position uh, in this case. Mm. 
I mean, it's not a one size fits all situation, is it? I mean, it's great that we can have a civil discussion like tonight, really different viewpoints, but actually can discuss and wrestle with that and hopefully not being vitriolic towards each other. So it's certainly not the university experience. There are lots of people in the church who have a very different view from me, actually, who are perfectly civil about that. And this is how I'd much rather the discussion go. But also I know people on both sides of the debate would have experienced the fact that people on the other side from them have often been really unpleasant. And yes, maybe in some ways it's getting harder to have that conversation. I wonder if in some ways, because in some context, it's reaching more of a crunch point as we're seeing in the CV context. I think also in culture, just we're getting less and less good at being able to recognise that people have different viewpoints and being able to learn to discuss those and kind of knowledge those and all that other stuff. I also want actually, as the kind of person with the uh, traditional viewpoint here, I want to kind of also put, I, although I don't think it's right when actually things are uh, vitriolic in the way they put it against people like me, I also do recognise that sometimes, maybe very often that's coming from people who have been generally really badly treated by people with my theology. I don't think my theology necessitates that bad treatment, but sometimes it's been there. And sometimes I know the reason our people are so anti at and even angry at people like me is because they've been really hurt and they've been treated in ways they should never be treated by the church. And so I guess I always want to have a humility if someone is coming at me in that way and think, I don't know what's in the background there. And it's quite possible that actually my brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, we together are responsible for hurting this person. So just to have a yeah humility, understanding. And whenever I can, I want to hear someone's story. Because so often, actually, there's real pain to be acknowledged and um, kind of, yeah, just kind of shared and journeyed through together. Charlie, any thoughts on that yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think we do sometimes play into a game of both sidesism, um, particularly in the Church of England that we've seen. So, you know, well, um, you know, LGBTQI people should behave better because, you know, that other people are being hurt and the rest of it. And 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 we suggest that there's a kind of equal. Um, there's an equal kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, effect on people who are in favour and who are, who are not in favour. Now, you have some people like Andrew who are not in favour of same-sex marriage, but for whom this is a personal issue. Um, but actually, I think in the main, you will, that, that, that you will find people on the, the people for whom this is not a personal issue are found on the, on the side that are not in favour of same-sex marriage and the people for whom it is a personal issue are found on on the other on, on the other side as it were and so i can see why um you know for example in the church of england we're not discussing um same-sex marriage and we're not actually even discussing uh, having an authorized service we're having commended prayers which may be used um, under conscience by clergy if they wish to use them and even that is being seen as um, a, a step too far and this is the LGBTQI takeover of the church and various other words which are really unhelpful and actually there's a power differential here um, LGBTQI people across every church tradition at different times have have been silenced and abused and the rest of it in the name of theology but often entirely atheologically um but have been abused and the rest of it and in many places still cannot celebrate their relationships in a way which they feel that they are called to do so that it, it's it's tricky but that none of that um excuses vitriol and and abuse um and but i do think we need to pay attention to the power dynamics of um, of this conversation or of this of rather of this lived reality for people uh, before we then address the vitriol and abuse because otherwise it can just become will everybody be nice to each other and that doesn't get to the grounds of where these difficulties come from or where the anger and the upset and the disappointment and everything else comes from so there's a big wellspring of hurt that sits in many places through this and we've got to address that which the Church of England has, in a sense, done through at least the idea of the pastoral principles, which, if anyone's remotely interested, are actually really helpful for conversations in general, in day-to-day -day life, speaking into silence, recognising our own biases and so on. That's, I think, a really helpful way forward. And I think, if anything else, um, finding ways to talk to rather than about each other has got to be a way of, of, of kind of um, processing ourselves through what's really a horrible, horrible situation. No one wants division. No one really wants division. And that's where we're ending up finding ourselves, I think. Well, there's perhaps leads nicely into this, this next question from Daniel, who says, how or can indeed non-affirming Christians be friends with people in the LGBT community? Uh, what's your experience of this, Andrew, if you do take a, 
conservative stance. Uh, is it possible to be friends with people who are just very much on the other side of that issue and both at a personal and theological level? I think, well, can we be friends with people in the LGBT community? Yes, because we're in the LGBT community, it's part of it. Can we be people who are friends with people who are not Christians in the LGBT community? Absolutely, of course we can, because we don't expect people who aren't followers of Jesus to be living in Jesus' way in any area of life, so it's not a big deal. Can we be friends with people who are Christians of very different views? I, I hope so, and I want that to be the case, and where people are up for that, absolutely. I think there's a different question of is there friendship there and is this a agree to disagree matter? So can there be friendship? I really hope so. Because uh, actually as Christians, we should be able to love anyone and have friendship with anyone. I don't, however, think that theologically this is an agree to disagree issue, which is why I think, although I don't want churches to split and I think it's heartbreaking to see what's happening across all sorts of denominations, I think it's unavoidable and can get to the point where it's the correct thing. Scripture, I think, does indicate there are some matters that are disputable. Are you can agree to disagree, and when you when that's the case, you prioritise unity over arguing and getting the same answer. Romans uh, uh, fourteen and fifteen. That's exactly what Paul's talking about in regards to whether you eat meat, whether you drink alcohol, whether you mark special days. But Scripture is also really clear. There are some things we can't agree to disagree on. Galatians here is the example of Paul engaging with that. He said, you can't agree to disagree on whether circumcision plus Jesus is necessary. It's Jesus plus nothing is necessary for justification. And it just seems to me that the severity with which the scripture talks about sexual ethics and um, sexual sin of all types suggests it's not an agree to disagree matter. The so reality is, let, let, let's give an example, um, you know, issues that have split the church in the past. Um, infant baptism, for instance, you know, uh, today, would you say that's a kind of from your perspective, Andrew, an agree to disagree issue. You can be you can be part of a church with someone who takes a different view on whether infant baptism is is a legitimate form of baptism or not. Um, uh, but, and why would that? And is that? And why this issue for you is one of those you can't agree to disagree issues. It it is it is a really important one in that sense. That's a great example because I have I thought through in detail whether I really think baptism <laughs> is a agree a disputable matter. Um, Probably well, maybe a, maybe give me one where there is it yeah. is more easily uh, an agree to disagree well, issue. I, I think I think forms of worship worship style. So if you came okay. to my church on Sunday morning, Charlie's church on Sunday morning, I think the the form that corporate worship takes would be radically different. Okay. And uh, and granted, it might be hard actually to have a service combining both of those. So it might be a practical thing of not being together. But that's an absolutely agreed to disagree. There's no music style dictating stuff that's absolutely agreed to disagree because scripture doesn't state it it's not clear it's not deemed an important issue or something we're even told about scripture talks about sexual sin as being an, an issue with potential eternal consequences and you know, think how seriously jesus takes even sexual sin in our own mind in matthew 5 i don't think it's safe for us to agree to disagree and i can't see jesus agreeing to disagree over sexual sin when he says even sexual sin in our mind is so serious you should metaphorically chop off parts of your limbs to avoid the eternal consequences of it charlie yeah i mean i don't think jesus would agree to disagree because i think jesus would probably have the answer on this one um but, but in a <laughs> he sense, might know yeah <laughs> one would hope so anyway um but but in a sense um uh, for me i feel like that that I still feel like there's a sense of contingency to the answer to uh, to same sex sexual relationships. For me, I, I can't. And, and, you know, we've, we've disagreed about this pretty, pretty clearly during this this conversation. Um, so for me, actually, I don't have an issue at all with um, with agreeing to disagree within the same church. And actually, um, I feel like there's a lot more for us to learn from one another and so on. And I, I'm not sure that this is something I don't think that, you know, on a, on a kind of Monday morning, the decision one way or the other has to be made. And then that's the end of it. Um, so for me, I actually think that Christians learning to disagree, I, I'm afraid it's a terrible buzzword in the Church of England, but learning to disagree well. Um, but I actually think disagreeing, genuinely disagreeing well, is a Christian virtue. But I accept from Andrew's perspective that if he has a strong position that scripture is, is un, uh, you know, is not, con there is no contingency. And that this is a very clear scriptural position. I can understand why for, for Andrew that, that that does become a matter of a kind of first order matter, however we want to describe it. But for me, it's not. Um, and I, 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 I partly say that because I have wonderful um, uh, colleagues and friends who I know disagree with me on this to varying degrees, who are back to my boring old Ephesians uh, fruits of the spirit stuff and building up the, the, the body of Christ who are building up the body of Christ and in whose congregations there are, an ama there are amazing things happening for the Lord. And so I, 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 that's why I suppose in a sense, I feel a level of contingency, which I, I appreciate 
people who hold a differing opinion can't hold. Mm. Maybe just as we start to wrap this up, I'd be interested in both your your thoughts on um well, do you do you think this is going to continue to split the church? Are we going to see further divisions? And and in the midst of all that, given that these are often the headlines that people focus on in the media, um, how can, from both of your different perspectives, the church offer a better welcome to LGBT people? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Charlie, and 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 then go to Andrew. Yeah, um, I just noticed in the chat someone was talking about um, uh, about um, having life abundantly and being uh, truly human, fulfilling our original vocation as image bearers, uh, and whether that was what I was thinking. Well, yes, absolutely, it's what I was thinking. So thank you for putting it in the chat, and I'm happy to have those words put into my mouth, because in a sense, <laughs> that is what I think the church is called to do, uh, is to find a way to uh, enable uh, LGBT people to be image bearers for God or image bearers of God's image. And for me, that does mean marriage. Doesn't mean marriage for everybody, but it means the possibility of marriage for those who feel called to that and who the church also feels is, are called to that. That for me is ultimately one of a panoply of options for uh, people who are attracted to people of the same sex, much as it is for people who are attracted to someone of the opposite sex, because of all the reasons which I, we, we've been discussing you know, today. So for me, that's the end point. But at the very least, we need to find ways to listen to people who are LGBT. And that includes Andrew, frankly, that includes people for whom this that is absolutely not what they feel called to. And we need to listen to what people feel called to in a much, much more significant way than the way that we presently have. And I think that's why we've got to where we have, because we haven't always listened to what LGBTQI people are asking and why they're asking it. Um, They're not asking for marriage um, because they like the idea of, of a kind of church wedding. There's often very significant theological grounding as to why people are asking for marriage or seeking marriage at the church. And for me, we need to listen to why they're seeking and calling for those things. And from that, work out how we respond. That's what a proper pastoral response is. And frankly, I think that's a better pastoral response in many ways than providing um, prayers which which sort of bless, but but might, might not mm. in the way mm. that the Church of England has probably got to. Final thoughts, Andrew, on, on how we pastorally care for people um from your perspective yeah i totally agree charlie that listening is so important it's something we've not done well and just that's a good start i I think um i just like to use the gospel uh kind of framework for this i think actually if the gospel fully shaped our our churches and our approach to everything will be helped so much so just noting that all of us are the same they're in this they're from the same boat as well we're all sinners we've all done stuff wrong we've all got desires putting us away from god's best and that's no more true of me as a gay guy than anyone else there should therefore be no shame for lgbt people people we need to push against that sense that we're different and need to feel great shame but then the wonderful truth of forgiveness in Jesus, but which is received through repentance and forgiveness and um, faith. So it's just not unusual that for all of us, there should be costing following Jesus. For all of us, there's denying ourselves, there's turning away from stuff. So again, I'm not being asked as a gay guy to do anything different than everyone else is asked to do. And then the gospel ends actually us walking in obedience to Jesus, which again is the denying ourselves, losing our life to find our life, all this kind of thing not being controlled by desires, but taking control of them, not gratifying the desires of the flesh, but through the spirit, um, not gratifying them. And again, if that's the normal Christian life for all of us, then actually that's how we welcome LGBT people. Because the problem is being we've singled people like me and Charlie and others out as somehow worse and weird and different and difficult to, to pass to a disciple. And it's the same gospel for all of us, but we all need to live that out in the radical way the Bible calls us to. So then when actually people like me live out with our theological convictions it doesn't look so weird and isn't so difficult so much more could be said but i think again the gospel right is certainly a a core starting point well look thank you both for engaging so graciously with each other on the show today um just a reminder that there are links for both of our guests andrew bunt and charlie bell and their books uh they're going to be in the chat They'll be in the links with this show if you're watching or listening at a later time. So do get hold of the books. Um, we've only scratched the surface in many ways of, of what are you know, some really deep arguments and conversations. Um, so it's uh, Finding Your Best Identity by Andrew Bunt. is uh, That's the, the book that Andrew's written. Queer Holiness by Charlie Bell is the book that Charlie has written. Um, do also, uh, if you're able to, um, support the show. Um, we love bringing conversations like these 
to you. Uh, it's it's really helpful, though, if you're able to stand with us as we do this. Um, we would really be encouraged if you're able to support the show financially. Uh, and we've got a special gift for you if you're able to do that from today's show. Um, you will receive Why You Can Believe. It's an ebook I've written on the case for Christian faith and answering some of the common objections. So um, that'll be a thank you gift if you support the show from today's webinar. Uh, you can find again the link in the chat or indeed uh, the link will still be available when the show goes out at a later date. We'll also follow up with an email and indeed you'll be taken to a page where you can find out more, click through to my guests and that offer as well. Just before we leave, um, just a heads up on what's happening next month with our next live show. I'm excited to say that uh, we're going to be able to ask William Lane Craig anything. One of the best known Christian apologists in the world is joining us for a live Q&A. So you can register for that right away if you want to. Uh, again, the link will be with you shortly on email and uh, on the screen that you get sent to. But look out for it on email as well. Unbelievable.live is always the place to go to register for these live events from Unbelievable. Thank you very much for being with us. And thank you for all the questions. And I apologize for the many questions we couldn't get to. There's lots of appreciation going on in the chat right now for both Charlie and Andrew. Uh, and I agree with all of it. Great discussion. Great points on both sides. What a great discussion. So impressed with both of these men and their ability to discuss thoughtfully and respectfully. Couldn't agree more with that. Charlie and Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.